Hallelujah. We thank God you've tuned into this message by David Entry at Caris Church. No hand can help you with the fulfillment of your destiny, but the word of God. May God's hand align you further into your destiny through this word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In in 1 Samuel, the Bible says that God told Samuel to go into the house of Jesse because he has chosen a king. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him for any of you? Fill thy horn with oil. Say, fill thy horn with oil. And go, I will send thee to, the, to Jesse, the Bethlehem, for I have provided me a king among his son. I hope you know that Samuel is not electoral commissioner. <laughs> he wasn't going to uh, oversee election. Um, Samuel had just been sent by God. But if God is choosing a king, why doesn't he go ahead? What has that got to do with Samuel? Because when God is appointing people, he sends agents. For what reason? For, for impartation. Because God doesn't use you without impartation. That is why he says that um, in, in Malachi, I will send my servant, Malachi chapter 4, my servant Elijah, before the great and the dreadful day, or before the coming of the, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. Um, verse 6 says that he will turn, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to, to the children and hearts of the children to the fatherless. He said, I will send, and that's the end of that's the end of the Old Testament. I will send Elijah. So John the Baptist, Jesus was coming, but there needed to be somebody to facilitate the process of impartation. So in Luke chapter 1, Bible talks about there was this priest called Zechariah. He fell, the Lord fell upon him for him to go and burn incense in the temple. So, um, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So he was a priest, and that's very important. The, you, in the Old Testament, you can't be a priest unless you are born by a priest. So the priestly office is dedicated to a family. So if your father is not a priest, you are disqualified from being a priest. That's why there was no way Jesus would have qualified to be a priest if he just limited to earthly realm or the law of Moses because he's not permitted to be a priest. He's permitted to be a king from the line of David, but he cannot be a priest because he's not from the priestly tribe. Is from the kingly tribe, Judah. So his priesthood is not according to the order of Aaron, which must be based on your birth or your progeny, but his priesthood is according to an endless life or an indestructible, Hebrew chapter 14, an indestructible life. The, a life that cannot be destroyed. Did I say chapter 40? I'm so sorry. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16. An, an indestructible life. It was made not after the law of carnal command, but after the power of an endless life. So when he resurrected, that endless life is on the grounds on which he became a priest. Because all the other ones, they died. That's why he liveth forever. He ever liveth, verse 25, he ever liveth, verse 21, 22, says that this other high priest, death prevented them from continuing. But he, because he has an unchangeable priesthood, hey, 
<laughs> but this man, talking about Jesus, say this man. This man. Say that again, this man. This man. Say for the last time, this man. This man. Let, let me get distracted and go back to 25. Let's, let's have some fun in scripture. 21. No, no, I mean 21. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him who said unto him, The Lord swore, the Lord swore and will not relent or repent. Thou art priest forever after the. There's a different order. The Melchizedekan order. Because, look, chapter 7 of Hebrew, you must master it. It's such a beautiful. I mean, look at how verse 1 starts, chapter 7, verse 1. This. <laughs> he said, for this, this guy, Melchi, bro Melchi, he was a king of Salem and a priest of the Most High at the same time. In Jewish time, no one can be a king and a priest. You can be a priest and a prophet. But you cannot be a king and a priest. King, uh, the priest of Most High, met Abraham from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. But someone bigger than Abraham, someone was able to bless Abraham. This man must be big then. Then the next verse says that to Abraham also uh, gave tenth, uh, paid tithe. First be interpreted king of righteousness and afterwards king of Salem. But look at the verse 3. Hey, without father. Ah, this king, eh? This king is without father. Yeah, you guys can sit down because this king, God bless you. This king is without father, without mother. Hey! Not only that, without descent, he didn't, he didn't descend from anybody. Without descent, with neither beginning of days nor end of life, but like this, like made like unto the Son of God, abided priest continually. The question is, if he abided priest continually, after he met Abraham, where was he? Where was he? He is like he fizzled out into exist, uh, extinction. Because after I met Abraham, we didn't hear about, he only showed up to meet Abraham, to bless Abraham, the father of all the priests. The father of all the priests, and you can't be blessed until a priest blesses you. It was the priestly blessing that changed or that covered Israel. You, need, you need, always need a priest, a priest to defray. So, but the father of the priests, the priest can bless his father. A priest cannot bless his father because he originated from a father. But if the father of all priests was blessed by another one, then Hebrews chapter 7 verse 8 says that without controversy, the, great, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In other words, the one who blesses you is greater than you. Verse 7, sorry. Without control, contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. So if this man blessed Abraham, then when he, when he, that means if he comes to the things of God, he was better. He was higher than Abraham. But Levi came from the loins of Abraham. In other words, he's Abraham descendant. So then, according to this, he says that when he was blessing Abraham, Levi was also inside receiving that. When Abraham paid, you only pay tithe to higher authority. When Abraham paid tithe to him, Levi, who was receiving the tithe, that means Levi is a very powerful guy. Higher than all, he was the one sitting to receive the tithe from the people, and then you bless them. The one who received the tithe is the one who blessed. You haven't brought your tithe, but you are coming to <laughs> bless it. You are not serious, spiritually not serious. <laughs> the one who received the tithe is a very powerful person. He's the same one who blesses. And so, if Abraham paid tithe to this man, that means that according to the law of Moses, the ones who have been receiving the tithe even paid tithe to someone higher. There was a higher priest who Levi submitted or subscribed to. He said that, uh, as I, uh, and as I may say also, so say, Levi also, who received tithe, paid tithe in Abraham. He was paying tithe to Melchi. Because he was without father. Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, without genealogy, without beginning of days nor end of days. He abides a priest continually. And Abraham met this personality. Then, see, this is all Hebrew chapter 7. Very interesting. 
Then he was talking about, then verse 14 talks about, uh, but Jesus does not come from Levi. He comes from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses didn't say anything about priesthood. So how can you come from tribe of Judah and be a priest? You cannot be a priest if you come from tribe. That's what he's saying. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So then, verse 15, and it is even yet far more evident for that after a similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. <laughs> so this priest that has risen is not coming from the normal one. It's coming from the similitude, the order, the kind of priest Melchizedek was. That said, uh, 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 this Melchizedek, that's how the service that He said, for this Melchizedek, he's a serious guy. Chapter, chapter 5, um, verse 10, 11, 12, somewhere there. He throws Melchizedek in. He said, Jesus Christ was made priest. After the order, called of God, a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. Look at what he said about Melchizedek, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, but hard to explain. See, you are dull of hearing. There's a lot to say about, but it's difficult to talk about it. This Jesus. So, so another priest has emerged, not from the ironic priesthood, but from the after the simi, I like the King James similitude. Hey, that's nice English. After the simi, if you go for interview, use it. After the similitude. <laughs> similitude of Melchizedek. Then the 16 talks about how his priesthood is based on the power on an endless life. So he abides forever. Jesus said, okay, I've, I've, we've had enough. This has not got anything to do with what I'm sharing. But we've had enough. You learned something. This, I love to talk about this always. This is, it's exciting. However, so Jesus Christ on earth before he started his ministry, he said, I will send Elijah ahead of you. I will send John the Baptist. He says that he will go before the Lord. There's a, the Bible says, the a voice crying, I am a voice of him who cries in the wilderness. Make, prepare ye the way. Who are you? Who are you? John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 23, 24. They ask him, so who are you that we can tell those who send us to us? The Bible said he, did, he denied not, but he answered in the voice of Isaiah. <laughs> King, uh, uh, NIV said he answered in the voice of Isaiah. He's, he, 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 I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as says prophet Isaiah. Look at NIV. Uh, NIV said this in a nice way. NIV. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, may you speak in the words of scripture. Amen. When people are asking, what, what, what do you think about yourself? What do you, may you be able to define yourself in the words of scripture. Amen. You are not defined by a boy in your life or a girl in your life or a wealth of a mother or a wealth of a father or your education. You are defined by who you, who you see yourself in scripture to be. People must always wonder, but who are you? Who are you? There must be a dimension of you that makes people wonder. No, this is not, your mother must be wondering. This is not my daughter. I know this is my daughter, but there's something about my, this is my daughter which makes me be very careful when I'm dealing with her. Yes. Your father must know that there's something about you. He can't explain. But there's something supernatural about you which can only be explained in the words of Scripture. Please sit down, sit down. <laughs> All right, so John the Baptist was the one to come. Why am I saying all these things? If I have not visited it, five minutes teaching, I'm supposed to teach. I've gone around it. Oh, God have mercy upon me. Baptist, why did he have to come? Because you cannot do ministry or do great things on earth without someone in an office being sent to impart you. That's why John the Baptist had to come because his father is from the priestly line. Jesus' father is an earthly father, carpenter. 
He's not called to be a priest earthly in the earthly realm. He needed someone who was in the priestly office one and already flowing in his office in ministry. So he went to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a prophet. He noticed him. He said, no, I can't, I can't baptize you. He says, sir, you have to. So it's, it's, it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 15. It's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. In what sense? Because according to the divine pattern, according to the divine order, this is how things happen. Someone must be sent to impart you. Yeah. So before Jesus was born, uh, before Jesus grew up to start his ministry, John the Baptist was commanding waves. Command Mark chapter one, but John was in the wilderness. Command Bible said, I think from verse five or so, all Jerusalem was going to him. Where they were going, where people were leaving and going, and they went. Watch this, and went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing. They were traveling. It's foul. And it's not like they were going for miracles. They are going to confess their sins. Wow. <laughs> this must be anointing. Yeah. This guy, according to Luke chapter 1, verse 15, was anointed from his mother's womb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, his anointing was unique because it was, it was, his assignment was exceptional. He was the one who was op operate in an office and from the priest line, not in the temple, because they have contaminated the temple. But operating under the Holy Ghost, so that when the Messiah comes, he can perform his official duties as John the Baptist. He was performing his duties in his rank. God has called him, called him, but his rank needed Jesus. He says that, he said, oh, in John chapter one, eh, he says that 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 Jesus, verse 31, 32, so that Jesus will be revealed. Therefore, I, I did not know him. He said, I did not know him. Look, watch this. He said, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I came. Why did he come baptizing? You know, some people who just confess. It was part of it. By his key assignment, that's why after Jesus was revealed and his, he, the, the John the Baptist is he, finished there, he died. His parents struggled to have him, and they didn't struggle to lose him. When he finished the assignment, he, he chopped his head off because he has to go to heaven. Heaven is better than here. So, John the Baptist said, so that Jesus will be revealed to Israel, therefore I have come baptized. Ah, so is that why you came? Yes. Therefore am I come baptizing with water, so that when it comes through the water, the heavens will be open. Oh, because the Holy Ghost, there must be an impartation on Jesus. Bible says, watch this in Acts chapter two, but verse thirty-one. Sorry, twenty-one. For whosoever twenty-one, whosoever shall call on this name shall be saved. Let's go twenty-two. It says that men and brethren, Jesus Christ, a man attested by God, signs and wonders and miracles. Watch this, which God did. By him, where? In your midst. As ye yourself. He was revealed to Israel. It wasn't done. They knew it. They knew. But that, that, that attestation of God couldn't have happened if he had not been baptized. So that this ministry will be revealed to Israel. He had to come. To, there must be a forerunner. There must be a John the Baptist. So David can become a king. Some, Samuel must hear from God. Fill your horn with oil. Go into the house of Jesse because there is a king there. I need you to go in part. That Saul of Tarsus can start his ministry. Ananias in Acts chapter 9 must be met by God and tell him, go and anoint him. Go and impress something unto him. Because he has to start his ministry. He has to start his assignment. Somebody must lay. If you see a man of God, a man of God, who can tell you who lays hands on them, who trained them, who imparted them, where they are coming from, pull back. No reference. If anyone does any academic exercise and does not have bibliology, no references, it's bogus. No attested by God. <laughs> Bogus. Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Shaphat. which poured water. Today's reading. On the yeah. hands of yeah. <laughs> Today's reading, yeah. 
Here is verse 11 and 12 and 13 or so. Yeah, verse 12, I think so. Elisha, he poured water. His, his father is Shaphat. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. You can trace Elisha to Elijah. Even though Elijah did, Elisha did twice more miracles than Elijah. He was transferred. He said, what, tell me what I should give you. Double portion of the spirit that's upon you. So, please sit down. Let's, let's, let's. Shakata bara sahaya. Somebody's catching an anointing. Sit down. That's why tonight I'm coming to do impartation. But, but I'm taking my time to speak. Because your doctrine that determines the safety of your future. It's your doctrine that will determine what kind of spirit is operating in you. It's the spirit of truth. It is not your miracles that determine what spirit you're operating with. It's your doctrine. That's why, don't be deceived. I never get de deceived or even bothered by how much following someone is having on social media. And w when I look at them, they don't look like men of God. At all. They don't look like men of the word. Some of these people look like celebrities. What's the point in a man of God showing how many kind of cars? That's rubbish. What kind of car you park around? And, and how many worldly celebrities attend your party? Are you, are you a man of God? That's all nonsense. Some of you, that's what you want to see. Um, sports cars. And so what has that got to do with a man of God? Let him open his mouth. Let's hear. Jesus is his mouth. And... Nonsense. I get weary of men of God who are always into businesses. Leave business for businessmen. A man of God, I'm coming out with my perfume line. My clothing line, men of God, uh, what a fashion line, clothing line. It's not a sin in itself, but I think you should be opening branches instead of this nonsense. <laughs> Get on the, 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 the go on missions and open branches. <laughs> clothing line for what? <laughs> we need branches, not brand. <laughs> All right, all right, guys, you are making me talk too much. <laughs> Stay in partition. Don't be deceived by whatever everybody is going. Look for God. Some of you, this prayer, sometimes, you see, it's just necessary to pray long. It makes kind of people, it exposes them. It, has, it separates people who are not really for Jesus, who are not really for the Spirit. It separates the wheat from the chaff. When you come here and then one hour prayer, if we'll have prayer, you are bored. What's this? What's this? Yeah, God is this. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we need long hours of prayers. It will break the flesh. The way you are struggling with pornography, the way you are struggling with fornication, masturbation, girls, the way you are struggling with arrogance, bitterness, you are struggling with the flesh. It's too much. We need protracted season of prayer without interruption. It will break that flesh. Sit down. One of the ways to catch anointing is being in an atmosphere of protracted prayer. It subdues the flesh. And it allows the spirit to keep rising. The spirit to keep rising. The spirit to keep rising. Your spirit man becomes strengthened. You can catch divine th things that are flying. Heavenly things that are flying, you can catch it easily. You know, if your immune system is good, you easily catch sickness and cold if you have. So people who have very low immune system, they have to be protected from even going to crowded especially sometimes because their immune system is weak. Anything, sickness, flying, can, or, you see, so in, in the spirits, it's like the flip side. 
Some people, their flesh is so strong, it's like an immune system against the move of the spirit. Yeah. They are immune against move, the move of the spirit. But the more we pray, we stay long in prayer, that negative system, immune, fleshly immune system, begins to go down. It begins to go down. It begins to go down. That your spirit arises to be able to catch things that are flying. That's when you catch anointing. We lay hands on you, you catch more than others are catching. Sit down, no, no, no. Oh, good God. Now, listen. So, laying on of hands is important for impartation. That's why Samuel was saw. Sorry, Samuel was sent for the impartation of David. Saul was sent to Samuel. So Samuel can impart him before he starts his office. Check everywhere in scripture. Before you get into your office, you have to, you have to be imparted. So it was always like that. And Jesus Christ needed John the Baptist in his office. Someone must already be operating in their office, authorized from above for the transfer to take place, impartation to take place. So one of the ways to impart is a laying on offense. Laying on offense has three ways, uh, sorry, four purposes. Number one, we lay on hands to impart blessings. Genesis chapter 48, verse 9. Joseph said, bring the sons of Jacob. Sorry, Jacob said, bring the sons of Joseph that I will bless them. He wanted to bless them. Bless them. He said, unto me, that I will bless them. Did you see that? That I will bless them. And when he brought them, verse 14 says, he crossed his hands. He put his hand on them. Uh, but what is his hand doing? That was the way he was going to bless them now. By putting his hands on them. Blessing is laying in Mark chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus said, bring the children. And they brought him to him. And he laid his hands on them, what? And he took them unto, into his arms, put his hands on them, and what? And blessed them, eh? <laughs> He blessed them. How did he bless them? By putting his hands on them. So number one purpose for laying on offense is for transference of blessings. Say, blessings. Yes. Number two is for I think you have to judge for yourself what number two is meant to be. In Mark chapter... Uh, okay, let's start from chapter 5, verse 23. Mark chapter 5, let's see what hands were laid for. Mark 5, 23, let's go. And he's starting greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and do what? <laughs> for what? <laughs> ah... So laying on offense is for healing. Verse 25, he, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 23 again. Mark, I don't have time, so write the scriptures. Can I tell you the references to write? Mark 8, Mark 8, Mark 8, 23, Mark 8, 25, Mark 6, 5, Mark 7, 23, sorry, 32, I'm sorry. Mark 7, 32. Are you getting it? You got it? Yeah. yeah. So Mac, we have Mac chapter 5, verse 23. Mac chapter 6, verse 5. Mac chapter 8, verse 23. Mac chapter 8, verse 25. Mac, I've said 6 already. 7, 30, 32. Luke chapter 4, verse 40. Luke chapter 13, verse 13. <laughs> Luke 4, 40, Luke 13, 13, 13. <laughs> Are you getting it? Yeah, it's there. Look at Luke 13, 13. Oh, I thought you'd be on the screen. Luke 13, 13. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified. This is a woman who was sick. Laid his hands on her, and immediately... <laughs> It was made straight and God. I like Mark chapter 16, verse 18. It says, they will lay their hands on the sick uh, and they shall recover. Did you see that? You see one of the purposes of laying on of hands uh, for the sick to recover. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 12, Ananias God to Ananias, Saul is praying. He has seen in a vision you laying on him, hands on him for him to receive his sight. <laughs> yeah. 
here. He seen it. You coming to lay your hands on him. Verse 17. And he went to the house. He said, Jesus who met you when you were coming has sent me to lay my hands on you that you receive your sight and feel the Holy Spirit. So lay on of hands for the re receiving of sight. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't it amazing? It's too, it's, too, it's too beautiful. In the, uh, um, that's Mark, uh, Acts chapter. And if you look at Acts chapter 28, verse 8, uh, uh, Paul laid hands on um, the, uh, Publius. He lay sick. He uh, was, and then Paul entered and laid hands on and prayed for him and laid his hand. All right. So you see, one of the purposes of laying on of hands is for healing. Amen. Amen. Healing. Now, the third purpose of laying uh, on of hands is to put people into leadership. Leadership. So, second, First Timothy chapter four, verse fourteen. Second Timothy chapter two. Sorry, First Timothy chapter four, four verse fourteen. Second Timothy chapter chapter one, verse six. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six, and Acts six six. They put them forth and they laid their hands on them. That's where before they were made, being made deacons. Acts 6 6. Acts 6 6. Acts 6 6. They, and whom they said before the apostles, and when they had prayed for them, they laid their hands on them. That's how they made them deacons in the church. So to appoint people into leadership. He said, Don't neglect the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands and the elders. So they lay hands and then, and in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, Joshua, son of Nun, he was full of the spirit of wisdom. Why? Because Moses had laid Deuteronomy chapter 34. I mean, I said 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, because Moses has laid his hands on him. All right. So Moses God laid his hands on him. Um, spirit of wisdom, because Moses laid his hands upon him. So, uh, office, hands were laid on him to go into office. And then finally, this is very important. Acts chapter 9, verse 17, it says that he went into the house, laid his hands on brother Saul, and he said, brother Saul, that you receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. In Acts chapter 8, verse 17, I said 9, 17 now, 8, 17. Uh, when uh, they, they had laid his, their hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Oh, wow. So they laid their hands and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Ah. Oh, yeah. So hands are laid for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. For the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So the apostles and Paul and Acts chapter 19, verse 6. Acts 19, 6, Paul laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13, verse 3. That one didn't say they received the Holy Spirit, but I think they laid their hands on them and they sent them forth. And you will see the impact of the laying on of the hands in the verse 9. Called Paul, full of the Holy Ghost full of the Holy Ghost. So hands are laid on people to receive the Holy Spirit. And when Paul has laid his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Amen. When Paul had laid his hand on them, the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy Spirit, but not, watch, this is very important, I'm going somewhere. Not just the Holy Spirit, baptism, but also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when hands are laid upon people, gift of the Holy Spirit is given. First Timothy, I quoted it earlier on chapter 4, verse 14. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. He laid his hands on them. First Timothy, second Timothy chapter 6, verse, sorry, chapter 1, verse 6. Second Timothy 1, 6. Oh, I've just read it already. It says that, wherefore I put you in remembrance that thou stay up what? What should you stay? I can't hear you. How many of you agree with me that this talking about spiritual gifts? Yes. What should you stay up? Stay up the gift of God, which is in you. How do you receive this gift of God? Yes. Through the laying on of my hands. So as they laid, as he laid his hands on them, these guys receive impartation, spiritual gifts. Yes. The kind of mantles that I saw flying in this room. There need to be some laying on of hands. 
Sit down, please. Let me show you something. I saw from yesterday people are collecting mantles. 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 And today I saw it again. I saw God is putting mantles on people. Mantles on people. That's why I took my time to teach you about the necessity of an officer laying hands for impartation. Now I can't lay hands on everybody because of time. But throughout this season, a lot there will be a lot of laying on of hands. And then the, the rest of you, if I get to see you fine, I shake your hands. It's another form of another form of laying on of hands for blessing. Sometimes, especially when people have not been trained from home, they believe themselves so much. Sometimes I meet them, it's interesting. I meet you after church, young lady, 18 years old, young man, 18 years, 21 years. See, see a senior man of God like me. I shake your hands. I say, God bless you. Then look at God bless you too. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> he said, without controversy, the lesser is blessed. You, you, who? <laughs> it's not annoying. It's not, a, but I just, uh, sometimes some people are too arrogant. No, it's not a sign of arrogance. Please don't get me wrong. Uh, it's more of ignorance. But some people, because they are ignorance, their arrogance comes through. You know, I deal with so many people. I meet people I know, and this person is very arrogant. But that, that, that's, that's, that's okay. When you see someone, a prominent person, you are out of order to stretch your hands and to shake him. Let them stretch your hands. It's not everybody I shake. Sometimes I'm not ready to shake. I'm operating by the spirit. I will look at you and touch your shoulder. You won't know that, but I'm aware. I'm a spiritual man. I pray by the spirit. I don't want anyone to be a charismatic member and you are ignorant. Basic protocols of the spirit, you lack it. Protocols governing, relating with the anointed, you lack it. That's why if you don't know how to relate with the anointed, it doesn't matter how pure your heart is, you will never catch the anointing. Wow. You will never catch the anointing. Yeah. Bible says, except he lay hands on a few sick. Anyway, he couldn't do much because they didn't know how to stay in line to catch the anointing. Most anointed people, when God wants to use them to bless you, they'll give you instructions. Yeah. Every anointing flows with instructions. <laughs> so they laid hands for the transference of spirit. I'm going to be laying hands on people because the anointings flying in this building. It is important to understand that anointings are flying. Yes. It's not a young man, it's an old man who said, he said, My eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Say, we will live to see a certain move of God in our time. We will live to see it. We've been praying for this getting to 10 years. We will live to see it. Some of you seated here, the anointings that are coming on you. Sit down, sit down. Oh, one of the crucial things the anointing requires, one is humility. You have to learn how to humble yourself. And along, oh, oh, can I tell you something? When your heart is after God and you see where you are finding God, okay, so let's say there's the fountain of life, water flowing. You didn't know, you came and tasted it. And oh, this is what my life has been looking for. And you are drinking of it. One year, two years, three years, four years, you are drinking of it. Don't be familiar. You can drink so my guess to a time you want to be smart. They say jo go and join the, the usher. But you believe that you have a music ministry. You are supposed to be a, a don't sing number two. Why should you be another person number two? You are supposed to, and so after being in the ushers for a year, they are still keeping you there instead of moving you to the choir. Just stay there faithfully and do it unto God. You see what? And when you remain faithful there for a long time with the connectivity to God, there's no way you miss out in destiny when you are doing it the right way with God. 
Mm. Is that? Mm. So, there is, say, there is a way you have to stay focused and consistent because it gets to a time in your journey, your mind begins to play on you. This thing is it worth it. I've waited for a long time, believing God for a, a miracle husband. It's not coming. Everybody's marrying and leaving me. Hey, just trust God enough and keep, keep going. Keep going. Trust God and stay focused. So if it's fasting, you've been fasting. If it's prayer, I've been praying. Sometimes things will get harsh. Things will get d- desperate. Sometimes you will even feel discouraged. But ignore that and keep going. Keep doing the right thing with a, a matter of time. It will just boom, it will just explode. Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. We pray you have been strengthened and enlightened. You can connect with David Entry on all relevant social media platforms, including Instagram and LinkedIn. You can also hear more messages from David Entry on all relevant streaming platforms and the Caris Church app. Don't forget to like and share the message. Be blessed.